Our next speaker is mathematician student at Yale University, and he's also executive director of Humanity Plus. I'd like to welcome Tom McCabe. Uh, thanks, Natasha. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom McCabe. I'm the Executive Director of Humanity Plus, a uh, student at Yale University, and I'll be working through Google this summer. Um, we've heard a lot of today about various bits and pieces of transhumanism, sort of various different concepts under the transhumanist umbrella, but um, a lot of people, if you just you know go out into the street and talk to them, they don't really know what transhumanism is. They might think that transhumanism is some interesting new variety of cheese. And so um, today, uh, I've want to give sort of an overview, not, not a comprehensive overview, but ju just sort of a brief introduction to the concept, just so that when someone says transhumanism, you sort of have a general idea of what people are talking about. Oh, uh, next slide. Next slide. So uh, this here is a quote from uh, Dr. Steele, if anyone watches his videos online. Humans, the pinnacle of creation? No, we're still in the prototype phase, so working out all the bugs, if I got that intonation right. Um, so humans, uh, out of all of the trillions and trillions of intelligent organisms that we will eventually create if we don't destroy ourselves, are the, the very first intelligent organisms which are capable uh, of building a civilization, where the, the very first out of billions, trillions, quadrillions, and were the first and probably the only intelligent organisms who weren't themselves intelligently designed. Um, if, you, if humans went and built an artificial intelligence, then that intelligence would be designed by another intelligence, whereas humans were not designed by an intelligence, they were designed by evolution, we were designed by trial and error, which is uh, a very buggy and very messy process. And so if you go into human biology and how humans work, um, there's uh, various stuff in biology, there's various stuff in the psychology literature, in the economics literature, heuristics and biases, the mistakes we make, uh, human errors, we find that there's a lot of problems with the design. But in the 21st century, what we'll be able to do is to take this technology that we've built, we spent the past 20,000 years building technology, and when we've built the technology, we've used the technology to make more technology, but we haven't used it to enhance ourselves. It, we have better technology, we have cooler gadgets now, but the, the people we have now, the, the minds that are building the technology are still basically the same as they were 20,000 years ago. Humans now aren't that different from humans as we were during the Stone Age. But with biotechnology, with uh, nanotechnology, with artificial intelligence, um, Ray Kurzweil, who uh, in my spare time, as little as that is, I'm a consultant for, um, talks about this a lot in his books, uh, we can actually go into the human body, we can remove our limitations, we can enhance ourselves, we can make ourselves faster, better, stronger, we can um, create new experiences, we can create new desires, we can create new modules of thought. So for instance, uh, I, uh, someone talked about this earlier where um, instead of have, we have a, a visual cortex and an auditory cortex, we can also have a, a magnetic sense, we can also have um, a, a data sense, we can also have a, a, a module in our brains for computer code. And we'll be able to, to do all this with the technology that we've created. So um, I don't have that much time here, and so th there are an infinite number of examples of things that we able to do with this technology, but uh, I'm just going to go over two ones very quickly. So uh, here's the problem that we have. Humans need air. So the, the uh, humans are basically a chemical engine, and we run on two components. We run on fuel and we run on oxidizer, just like a rocket does. So the fuel is our food, and f food is like solid matter, solid and liquid, and so it's relatively easy for us to store. In fact, us Americans over the past two decades have become increasingly proficient at storing very large amounts of it. Um, and, and so you, you can store within the human body a few kilograms of food, which is you know, enough to keep you running for a few weeks if, if you, you can't get food anywhere else. However, we have a problem with storing the oxidizer because our oxidizer, which is oxygen O2, comes in the form of a gas, and it's a difficult engineering problem to, to store large amounts of a gas. And so the result of this is that if your lungs clog up or if you get something stuck in your throat, if you stop breathing for any reason, if you have like a cardiac arrest, then it's going to be five, ten minutes and your cells are going to run out of oxidizer. They're not going to be able to work anymore and, and then you're dead. Um, it, you, you can imagine a, a computer that was built like this. If an engineer at Dell built a laptop that had a little switch and he had to toggle the switch every 20 seconds, and if you didn't toggle the switch every 20 seconds, uh, the, the, the whole time you were using it, it would crash and all the data on it would be lost forever. We would consider that a very poor design. Whoever designed that would probably be fired. 
And so um, the problem here is that the thing that we use in our blood to store oxygen, this protein called hemoglobin, you've probably heard of it, um, is very inefficient. You have this whole huge molecule protein complex, but it can only store in it a few molecules of oxygen. But we can do a lot better with technology, with a nanotechnology. Uh, yes, uh, with nanotechnology, we can build these things called respirocytes, which are sort of artificial versions of the, the hemoglobin proteins that we have in our cells. You uh, build this metal framework, this sort of little me me metal bu bubble, which is going to be a few nanometers across. It's going to be smaller than a human cell, and so it can circulate through all of our capillaries. And it can store, relative to its size, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times more oxygen than a human red blood cell can store. And so within yourself, in addition to storing however many kilograms of food, however many kilograms of fuel, you also might be able to store a, a kilogram of oxidizer. And so instead of having to breathe every 20 seconds, you can you know, hold your breath for, for minutes, for hours, uh, d depending on your activity level and how much oxygen you're using. I believe someone did out the math and figured out that if you're, even if you're like a high-powered athlete and you're like sprinting all out with, with a very first stage of this technology, you could hold your breath for 15 minutes and keep sprinting at top speed for 15 minutes and you wouldn't run out of oxidizer because you would already have a, a large supply of it within your bloodstream. And so in addition to the obvious sun implications of this, like you'd be able to dive underwater and keep swimming underwater for hours without having to carry all this bulky scuba equipment with you. Um, this also has huge health implications because two biggest uh, killers, number one and three in the United States, is heart attack and stroke. And what is a heart attack? What is a stroke? It's an obstruction of the blood supply, of the oxygen supply. And so instead of it being, well, if the Heart, if you have a heart attack, if the oxygen supply is obstructed, instead of it having to be within a few minutes or, or you're dead, you can, you, know, you can go for a number of hours. You can have time to get to the emergency room and for doctors to look at you and to fix it you, uh, to, to fix your problems before, you run it, before the cells in your body run out of oxygen and they start dying. So uh, that's the first problem. And so th th that's an old problem. Uh, we've had it for quite a while now, but this one is a more recent problem. So um, in the world nowadays, we have two big information universes, sort of. We have the information universe inside our head, the wetware, and we also have the information universe on our computers, on our iPads, on our servers, which is the dryware, silicon hardware. And both of these are pretty large. We have terabytes of data in, in our brain, and we also have terabytes of data on, well, not this computer, but on, you know, on the Google servers, on the internet, the, on Wikipedia that we can access and so forth. And so we have these two big networks of information, but the, the problem is the bandwidth between them is very small. The connective ability is very limited. Like, I can go onto my computer and download all of Wikipedia tomorrow. I can download all three million articles or whatever they're up to, but I'd never have time to read it. it, it, it the normal way, if you're going to gather information off of the network by reading it, if that's how you're going to transfer it from the computer into the brain, it's going to take forever. I could spend, I don't know, probably hundreds and hundreds of years reading through all of this information in Wikipedia. And so effectively, even though it's out there and we've built it all, we've done a lot, we've done a lot of work building it all, we can't use a lot of it because there's no way for us to get it into our brains. And it's the same problem in reverse. If you have, say, a sensory experience, say you went to the Bahamas and you had a lot of fun there, there's no easy way for you to transfer what that felt like into a form such that other people or other computers can, can, can uh, have it and understand it easily. I mean, you can approximate it with words and so forth, but uh, it, it's not really going to be exact. It's going to be like a, a very fuzzy copy, a very low bandwidth image. But a uh, technological solution to this problem, uh, over the next few decades, we're going to continue developing brain computer interfaces. And this is already, which is going to be, you go into the brain, you take the neurons in your brain, and you connect them to a silicon hardware, and then you have wireless radio, which takes the um, uh, silicon hardware in your brain and connects it to the worldwide computer network. And we already had this technology in embryo. We have uh, someone uh, a few years ago built a device which you could implant into the brain, implant into the visual cortex. And um, it would hook into the, uh, a camera that you could mount on top of your head and so even if you were completely blind, even if you had like a blindfold in front of your eyes, you could still see well enough in order to drive a car in a parking lot because um, you had the, the visual information 
from the camera was being fed directly into your neurons using this uh, a computer technology. And eventually, as Moore's law progresses and we understand the brain better, we can solve this bandwidth problem by moving from a few hundred bits a second, which is what we have now with reading and writing and speaking and so on, to kilobytes a second to megabytes a second. And so we'll be able to take, within the next few decades, all of this vast storage space of information that we've accumulated on the computer and actually transfer it into ourselves, into our own minds, so that we not only have the, the entirety of human knowledge accessible through a computer terminal, we actually have it accessible within ourselves, so that if you are thinking about, say, the uh, 30 Years' War back in the 17th century, you don't have to look anything up. You can just think about it, and all of the thoughts will automatically fall into place, because it will all be downloaded off of the computer network through the brain computer interface. And so um, there's a lot, uh, a lot more problems that we could go through that are solvable with uh, 21st century technology, but uh, I think I'm out of time. So uh, thank you all for coming, and I hope you had a wonderful time here. And I thank uh, Natasha and Ed Keller, uh, Natasha's uh, vice chairman uh, of our board at Humanity Plus, for taking the time to uh, put this conference on and show us all such a wonderful time.